Welcome back, guys, to episode 15 of Project Life Goal. I have been absent for way too long, unfortunately not making as much progress on the build as I would have liked to. In this episode, we're going to look at me finishing off the horizontal stabilizer and the right elevator. Let's get into it. My name is Grant Powers, and I'm fulfilling a lifelong dream one day at a time. This series chronicles the build of an experimental RV7 two-seat airplane in my garage. My love for aviation was instilled in me by my grandfather at an early age, and now I'm seeing my dream become reality. This is Project Life Goal. Since I've been absent since May, this footage is actually from the end of May and the beginning of June where I finished off the horizontal stabilizer and we'll look at the right elevator later. Uh, you'll have to forgive me a little bit. Some of the things that I know I said I was going to talk about, I may miss and I may repeat myself on some items as well. Uh, the jig that I use, definitely absolutely necessary. I'm pretty sure I've said that before. I would not even start the match drilling process without uh, making a jig similar to this or at least one that performs the same function. Uh, I've actually already gotten rid of this jig. I sent it out to a uh, fellow builder who is just starting on the empennage kit out in Arizona. So hopefully he will put it to good use soon. <clears throat> This is the only shot I got from inside the horizontal stabilizer during the riveting process. I quickly realized it was just going to be way too difficult to uh, work around that camera and also get enough light in there. Uh, even though that white primer does help uh, reflect some of the light that I was able to get in there. You start off uh, in the final riveting process by riveting on the nose rib there in the middle. You have the the next rib behind it, just click it in there temporarily to keep the form of the skin. We'll end up removing that rib, uh, inserting the forward spar, and then returning that rib back in. The riveting process here on this nose rib was, was not difficult. Uh, just a little bit of a reach there towards the nose. Uh, definitely be very careful with those angles. I did notice my rivet gun placement uh, was not the most precise and occasionally it did slip, which you'll see throughout the, the video process here. Fortunately, no terribly messed up rivets. I think I only redrilled one or two uh, to replace them, but uh, that could be inaccurate at this point because it's been a few months. So what I've been uh, doing in the meantime since this footage is back from uh, late May uh, there's a lot of things that happen during the summer for me personally, uh, also professionally for my day job. And then, as I said in a previous video, I do have some hobbies that uh, can only happen in summer, which got in the way quite a bit despite the limitations imposed by uh, COVID, which is not something that I was anticipating. I actually thought I was going to be able to get a lot done this summer. And then here in Wisconsin, uh, the heat started to get unbearable for me. I'm definitely a, a snowbird uh, in the sense that I like snow, not in the sense I like going to Florida. So for basically all of uh, July and August, my garage was an unbearable for me, 90 degrees. How some of you guys down south built in uh, un air conditioned garages is uh, beyond me. So hats off and kudos to you uh, that are doing that. Uh, I don't care for that at all. A uh, air conditioner is definitely in my future for the garage uh, for next year. So what you're seeing here is we've actually gone ahead and placed the forward spar assembly into the horizontal stabilizer assembly and we're doing blind rivets uh, from that middle rib into the nose rib through that front spar assembly. Uh, I do have one of the Milwaukee uh, cordless uh, blind rivet tools and it would not fit in there so I did have to use the, the manual rivet tool. And then mostly out of curiosity, I did use my inspection scope to check on the backside of those blind rivets since uh, I've never really paid much attention to them. So I wanted to see what they looked like. And the process repeats on the other side. I tried to keep myself balanced and do the same operations on the left and the right side at the, the same time. Uh, after doing those blind rivets, you then move on to rivet on the, the middle rib and the front spar assembly was is what I'm doing here. 
So I just want to take a moment to thank uh, some of our new subscribers that subscribed while I was an absentee. It was great to see that there were still people watching the content and excited to follow along in the process. So welcome to Project Lifeful. Thanks for joining us. I will do my best to try to be more consistent about getting videos out there as uh, time allows, of course. Uh, hopefully with uh, winter and fall approaching here in Wisconsin, I'll be able to get a little bit more done. The garage is actually a, a nice, calm, balmy, and very enjoyable 65 degrees compared to the 85 that it was uh, for most of July and August. I will say the only part about this jig that kind of drove me a little nuts was obviously it does cover some of the rivet locations. Um, I'm not sure how you would really make a jig that didn't cover those uh, rivet locations. If it was a, a firm, hard jig like this one is, perhaps with just the strap and webbing approach, you could move those around a little bit easier. Uh, so you do have to do a little bit of dancing ar around the jig if you take the approach that I did. Uh, not terrible, just as you see there, you kind of bump into it, which does impact your visibility and tool placement of the rivet gun occasionally. And then once you finish all the other rivets, obviously you got to come back and Make sure that you rivet in a, a few that were covered by the, the uprights or the verticals of that jig. The riveting of these front spars was actually fairly easy. I think it was a little bit easier than the vertical stabilizer uh, front spar. Um, until you get to the, the outboard side of the stabilizer itself, because obviously the uh, interior height is slowly decreasing as you get further and further towards the outboard edge. So it just required a little bit of care, uh, some interesting hand contortions uh, for me, and obviously taking care of, uh, of the placement of that, that bucking bar. So you weren't doing too much uh, ancillary damage to other parts uh, during the process. I will say the tungsten bucking bar is definitely the right way to go. I didn't have a tungsten bucking bar for the vertical stabilizer. Uh, I acquired it somewhere after the vertical stabilizer, but before riveting the horizontal stabilizer here. So much nicer to use, uh, much smaller, easier to get into uh, the tight spaces that exist in these uh, stabilizers. So if you haven't made your bucking bar purchase yet, just go straight with the tungsten bucking bar. Um, I'll cover the bucking bars a little bit more for the right elevator since I did run into some issues there, but save that for a little later in this episode. The uh, process kind of continues on the top of the bottom um, for both sides of the, the stabilizer. So a lot of the, the video footage here looks very similar even to me since I'm the one that did it. You would think I would uh, remember, uh, but being several months ago, it's difficult without that label there that I can see in the video. I, I don't think I could have told you if it was the, the left side or the right side, the top or the bottom. I'm almost done with the riveting on that front spar assembly at this point and then we'll go ahead and we will move on to the rear spar assembly. But before we do, I do have kind of one question for the more experienced builders out there. Um, as you see, I'm using a, a plain mushroom set. I did see that they make one that's got uh, a rubber boot around the outer perimeter of that mushroom set. Um, I'm just wondering if that helps you guys at all um, with the gun sliding off uh, or keeping your placement or if it's just more of a nuisance. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts uh, if you have any experience using one before I make the plunge and invest in one. Just kind of curious for some anecdotal evidence. And for those of you that aren't following along with the Facebook page for Project Life Goal, um, I did actually solo back in June. So that was... Uh, a great accomplishment, very nerve wracking for sure. I don't think I've been so nervous before as uh, as I was that day. And I knew what day it was too. Uh, it wasn't like it was a surprise um, on the part of my instructor. My instructor actually wanted me to solo a little bit earlier than I felt I was comfortable. But uh, even though we knew that that was the plan for the day when she, my instructor said she was getting out of the airplane, I was uh, very, very nervous. Certainly a responsibility, and uh, that, thankfully it, it went well. Um, so very happy to have that step completed. Uh, looking forward to completing all of my solo time and cross country. Um, that's the steps that I'm on right now. 
And now that we're wrapping up the riveting of that front spar, I'm gonna start shifting the whole assembly in that jig and get the rivets that were covered by the uprights of the jig itself on both the top and the bottom side of the horizontal stabilizer. Um, again, not hard to do. Just be very careful, make sure that you get all of them. Don't skip one because pretty soon you're not gonna have access to them once we start riveting on the rear spar assembly, which you see me clicoing in right now. I do wanna take this opportunity to give a quick shout out to Mike over at High Tech Incorporated. High Tech is the company that actually manufactures the pneumatic squeezer. Uh, I did encounter some problems with the pneumatic squeezer. What was happening was uh, when I was not using the tool, but it did have air pressure applied to it, uh, there was some blow by, some air coming through the pedal. So I was uh, working with Mike over there at uh, High Tech uh, in troubleshooting that issue. Very great to work with. They definitely do stand behind their tools. And uh, we were able to come to the resolution uh, to fix the problem. What it ended up being was uh, just that the, the seals uh, inside of the tool itself needed a little bit more uh, lubricating grease. Uh, thankfully, there's a gentleman in our neighborhood that works with pneumatic systems all the time, so we had the proper grease on hand so that I could just regrease those O-rings myself and not have to send it in uh, and wait for an RMA process. But again, thank you, Mike, for your, your help. Really appreciate it. Uh, definitely a great company to work with. Uh, and no, YouTube, I did not receive a paid promotion for that. Uh, just wanted to give an honest shout out to a, a good company. I'm gonna go ahead and say it again. I know I'm repeating myself for sure on this one. I really do enjoy using the pneumatic squeezer. It did take me a bit to get used to uh, the right shims to use. Uh, there's actually some charts or math tables that, that approximate the ones that should work depending upon the, the rivet size, uh, which I've been basing off of and it's just taken some, some time, some experience to actually get the, the right shims that I need to use for my particular setup. Obviously there's going to be some variances between tools and, and yokes, so on and so forth. Uh, but now that I've started to to gain that uh, experience, it's easy, easy for me to change out the, the necessary shims depending upon the rivet size and the particular uh, application. Uh, like when using most tools, you know, as you get more familiar with them, you constantly think about things you'd like to change, things that you wish were different. And outside of just uh, not having to use shims and having it be adjustable like uh, most hand squeezers are, I mean, that's really all I can say. Uh, obviously, I did have that one issue, but we got through it. That was minor. <clears throat> that could happen with any tool, not having enough lubricant uh, on a um, air O-ring seal like that. So I don't really fault them on that one. The riveting of the rear spar assembly, fairly straightforward. <clears throat> a little bit of dancing around the, the hinge locations. Uh, nothing terrible, uh, very easy to, to work around. You just spend a little bit more time uh, making sure you've got the squeezer in the absolute right position. The part that did get difficult was actually as we start to approach the nose end of these outboard ribs. I was able to do them all on the horizontal stabilizer uh, with the uh, pneumatic squeezer. I uh, just had to adjust which um, sets I was using. I did purchase um, some sets that are, are very low profile and some that are, are much taller than the, the standard. So it just took finding the, the right combination to be able to squeeze that yoke in there. And after completing all of the riveting of the skin to the rear spar assembly and the outboard ribs, there are a few blind rivets that you have to place through the rear spar assembly, the doubler, and into the ribs and then as you see here the rear spar to the outboard rib no doubler there but those ones were solid rivets i just did those with the hand squeezer um, mostly because i didn't feel like uh, tearing down the the maddox and finding the right shim sizes for just those couple of rivets since i don't do a lot of those so i don't have the the shim measurements measures memorized yet for those and then I move on to doing the right elevator. 
You start off by riveting the counterbalance rib to the end rib. It was difficult to find a combination of flush sets and shims that would and yoke that would actually work. So what I ended up doing was uh, <clears throat> just assembling the the yoke and the the rivet sets and shims around the two ribs, leaving it on uh, as opposed to taking it off. A little bit awkward, but it, it worked. I had thought about using a rivet gun and bucking bar to, to do these, but I think them being universal head rivets from a stability perspective, the, the squeezer was still the way to go, uh, even if it was a little awkward. Then moving on to this bar assembly, uh, clicking on the hinge doublers and riveting those in place, I found that uh, I fought getting the rivets in quite a bit. I'm sure it's just a combination of the relatively tight tolerances of the holes that are drilled and then the primer buildup. So occasionally I did have to remove a little bit of that primer from the inside of the holes to be able to get the rivets in completely. You see me struggle trying to push them in by hand here and there. I uh, was able to just squeeze them through occasionally and not have to partially re-drill that hole out. And then after finishing with those hinge doublers, we're going to go ahead and rivet on the root rib to that spar. I have to say from a assembly perspective, the elevator from a rib spar to skin is probably one of the easier ones to do, mostly because you just have that one really tight bend on the trailing edge. You don't have a, a long sweeping curve like you do with the stabilizers. It's flush rivets between that root rib and the spar so that you can then put the uh, elevator horn over that without the rivet heads getting in the way and then you move on to doing the riveting of the counterbalance skin to the elevator skin itself and rivet on the counterbalance rib and end rib to the spar assembly this one was a, a little bit difficult doing those 1 8 rivets on the inside uh, very tight quarters uh, you have to kind of bounce around a bunch of flanges on the, the ribs and the spar themselves but definitely doable with a little bit of patience. And then you slide in the, that whole assembly into the, the skin, place in that counterbalance weight, and click the whole assembly together in preparation for final riveting. The counterbalance weight is a little bit difficult to slide in there. Um, you just gotta to play with it a little bit to find the, the right angle to slide it in there. And once it's in there, it's a real nice tight fit. So that's definitely not going anywhere, which is good since it's obviously a very critical component. After some conversations with some very experienced builders of Vans aircraft, I opted to not uh, trim that counterbalance weight uh, at this point in time, since I am uh, still deciding uh, what I want to do for final attachment of the fiberglass tips and I'm also saving all of that for the end of the project as well I'll do all the fiberglass at once so I'll have to make that decision um, later on once I have a better idea of how much I'm actually going to have to take off and that was honestly one of the uh, fear points for me was taking too much off so I just went ahead and left it whole at this point and what you're going to see me do right here is I'm going to actually use the Milwaukee knife there. And what I'm doing is I'm actually pushing the flanges together. What I'd found was after riveting the, the elevator skin, the counterbalance skin, the, the end rib and the spar rib, uh, they wanted to kind of, the flanges of those ribs wanted to kind of push apart. So I just used that Milwaukee knife to push them back together as I squeeze them. Uh, not hard, just uh, something to pay attention to. Uh, obviously, every time you rivet, it kind of squeezes uh, the material out a little bit so you know things don't necessarily fit the exact same way they did when you match drilled them and then you just continue to rivet along that spar and then down that root root rib getting around the elevator horn was not difficult this is all very similar to things that we've already done before the trailing edge of that root rib though i know i would get questions about it uh, if i don't address it now the the last couple of rivets on either side of the elevator skin are very difficult to do with a squeezer and in fact they are almost impossible to do the especially on the uh, outboard and rib um, I, for now I've actually left them open I had ordered a different tungsten bucking bar with a much smaller profile so I'm gonna come back after the fact and 
take care of those last couple of rivets that I wasn't able to do with the squeezer, even with the, the flush set. And we repeat the same process on the other side of the elevator skin. Again, the same trouble points. Uh, that point where you have uh, the rivet going through the skin, the counterbalance skin, uh, and then the spar and the rib. Same thing, just be careful, keep a mindful eye on those flanges, make sure that they're not bowing out on you, get a nice flush set once you set that rivet. Uh, again, I just used my Milwaukee knife to kind of push everything together. That worked out pretty well for me. You could probably use a, a pick set to, to do the same thing, uh, or if you had a really, really deep clamp, maybe. Um, it might be too tight to, to use a clamp um, with that squeezer in there as well. And with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. We're at 82 hours of build time for a total of 95 hours of project time. That does include the unpacking and inventorying of the wing kit. The wing kit did arrive in late July, which was a couple weeks behind schedule for when Vance was originally anticipating having it to me, but that's okay. So that will be the next episode, is that process of receiving the wing kit and unpacking it. I want to go ahead and thank all of you for your patience as I've been absent. I'm looking forward to getting on a regular schedule of building and getting you guys videos again. So if you're enjoying these, go ahead and make sure you hit that like button for me. Subscribe if you haven't already to follow along so that you will get alerts when I do publish the videos. And with that, guys, go ahead, get out there, start your life goal. And if you've already started your life goal, leave a comment below and let me know. I'd be curious to, to hear about your projects. We'll see you next time. Take care.